Hello and welcome to this MedChemNet interview with Professor Ramaswamy Narayanan. Professor Narayanan is Professor of Biological Sciences at the Charles E. Schmidt College of Science at Florida Atlantic University in the USA and joins us as part of our April focus on drug discovery for mosquito-borne diseases. Professor, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Stella. It's a pleasure to uh, participate uh, in this. That's great. So I'm going to jump straight in. Would you tell us a little bit about your professional background? What began your interest in chemoinformatics? Sure. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Ireland in Dublin in 1980. And uh, then I moved to the U.S. for my postdoctoral training. I started at the National Cancer Institute and then at the U.S. Centers for Disease Control. I was working at the molecular biological aspect of retroviruses, including HIV. And uh, then I moved on to academia. I went to the Yale University in New Haven and to Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, expanding on my retrovirus experience and started working on gene therapy aspects of bone marrow stem cells using the retrovirus as a delivery vehicle. I then wanted to develop a drug discovery type of hands-on experience, and I wanted to see how industry uh, approaches targeted drug discovery type of perspective. So I joined the pharma industry, Hoffman LaRoche in Nutley, New Jersey. I was there for about 10 years, and I was involved in the preclinical research development, in particular, druggable target identification and antisense type of validation of the drug target. I was also involved at the very, very early stages of bioinformatics infrastructure. These were almost pre-human genome project type of era. And that is what kind of sparked my rest of the career's interest. And I realized that uh, uh, bioinformatics at that, that time was simply a self-taught type of discipline. And we didn't have any courses, we didn't have any degrees. So one major unmet demand was the trained workforce. So I decided to come back to academia to help create a biotech workforce and biotech bioinformatics awareness. So for the last about 18 years, I have been working at Florida Atlantic University, developing a bioinformatics infrastructure. While largely focusing on cancer as a therapeutic area, recently I started expanding it to other uh, infectious disease, particularly Ebola and more recently, Zika virus uh, uh, area of research. What kind of sparked my interest in chemoinformatics was about five or six years ago, I hosted uh, Sir Harry Croto, the Nobel laureate from UK, uh, the buckyball uh, scientist, and uh, talking to him kind of stimulated my interest in blending chemistry with biology. And uh, that's where I developed an interest in uh, chemoinformatics. I realized that uh, there are more effective ways to go after lead discovery in the context of smart lead identification rather than just a random type of approaches. So over the last five years, I have been using chemoinformatics as one of the basic tools in my uh, uh, effort to discover druggable targets as well as lead identification for some of these therapeutic areas. Mm -hmm. So you recently published an article entitled Zika Virus Therapeutic Lead Compounds Discovery Using Chemoinformatics Approaches. Could you briefly describe the findings? Sure. Um, Zika virus has become, as you, as you know, that a very big global healthcare emergency. And uh, despite the fact that we knew about this virus since 1964, we have very little information about what type of host proteins, that means human proteins, would be targets for Zika virus. So when we want to go after pathogen uh, therapeutics, we can either go after viral specific targets or host cell specific targets. We decided to go after the host cell because there are a lot of advantages. We have considerable experience in the area of HIV, hepatitis B, going after the host cell as a therapeutic target. And uh, host cell targets are necessary for these viruses to uh, uh, enter into the cell, into the body and replicate, etc. And equally importantly, some of the host cell targets might be the basis for already approved FDA drugs and hence opening avenues for repurposed type of drug-based effort. So because of that, we decided to go after the start with the human genome as a starting point. While we didn't know much about the uh, Zika virus targets, Zika belongs to a flavivirus family, 
a lot of other viruses like chikungunya, dengue, uh, Japanese encephalitis, West Nile, yellow fever. They all share a lot of protein motifs and domains. So we hypothesize that because of the shared motifs and domain, perhaps there must there exist a group of proteins that would also be shared functionally. So using bioinformatics approaches, we first created a list, a database of genes that are common to all of these flaviviruses. Then we use a lot of additional filters to pull out putative candidate proteins relevant to Zika virus. And so we developed about 55 protein lists uh, uh, through this effort. And these proteins uh, included enzymes and receptors and cell adhesion molecules, transporters. All of them are what we call as druggable proteins. And equally interestingly, several of these proteins already are drug targets for FDA approved drugs. So our first part of the study resulted in the identification of druggable targets as well as FDA approved drugs, some of which can be used for repurposed medicine. And these drugs are uh, used currently for the treatment of the diabetes to cancer, antiretroviral, antihypertensive, anti-inflammatory type of drugs. And many of them already are used with pregnant women. And we have to keep in mind that Zika virus uh, main cohort of patient at the present time are pregnant women. So, so at least some of these drugs are likely to be safe in terms of uh, uh, their potential testing in, with the pregnant woman. So using that database of genes, we then uh, uh, went back to applying chemoinformatics to see whether we can discover drug-like molecules and uh, we used a fantastic tool from UK, which is from the Institute of Cancer Research called CAMSAR. And uh, while it's largely geared towards cancer target discovery, because it encompasses the entire human genome and the human proteome, it's, it can be applied to any other therapeutic areas. So we scanned our Zika virus database of genes using the CAMSAR data, uh, uh, tool and ended up identifying several drug-like lead molecules when I say lead, lead molecules, that means they are active in no nanomolar concentrations in cell culture assays, and they are small molecular weight, less than 500, and they don't have toxic side chain, that means no toxic four. And they're also what is called as rule of Pfizer's rule of five compliant, that means they're orally bioavailable. And that's why we call this class of compounds as, as, as a, a drug-like molecule. So that means these two studies have resulted at the present time in a list of druggable proteins, as well as list of drug-like lead, drug lead compounds. And some of these compounds can very easily be tested in cell culture model. Currently, we don't have any animal models available to test the Zika. However, the primary target for Zika in the human uh, uh, system are as one can predict the skin cells, keratinocytes, fibroblasts, and immature dendritic cells. So these cells can be infected with the Zika virus. And one can ask a question whether these drugs, uh, all of them are freely available from Chem Ember library, as well as from PubChem type of library system, that uh, whether they interfere with, with, with the viral uh, growth as well as replication, et cetera. That means, these together with the drug, uh, druggable proteins, we also have lead compounds ready to test in cell culture model. So we hope this study provides the initial framework for drug verification against the Zika uh, 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 therapeutics. Mm -hmm. So you touched on this very briefly, but what are the particular challenges faced in discovering drugs for the Zika virus? Yes, Zika virus drug discovery certainly uh, offers quite a bit of challenges. First of all, we know very little about it and very few publications exist at the present time other than a lot of case reports. Uh, uh, Zika virus basically uh, yeah, belongs to a family called flaviviruses. And to date, our experience of drug discovery against any of these flaviviruses, dengue, West Nile, uh, yellow fever, etc., cetera, uh, has not been very good. That means we don't have a lot of drug discovery experience in the context of this group of viruses. Another challenge is that the, uh, the, the clinic performing clinical trial for Zika virus therapeutic 
is going to largely involve pregnant women. And that means it uh, imposes considerable difficulty in terms of how to perform the clinical trial. And in fact, until very recently, we, the regulatory agencies didn't even have very clear guidelines. Only about four or five years ago, both the US FDA and the European regulatory agencies have come up with very clear set of guidelines to be test used in the context of pregnant women drug testing. So um, uh, these are some of the problems I, I, I see in, in terms of development of Zika virus therapeutic. Clearly, from a long-term perspective, vaccines is going to be a, a preferred route. And uh, certainly for other flaviviruses like uh, dengue, uh, encephalitis, uh, yellow fever, vaccines work. And uh, West Nile virus vaccines is in clinical trial. So it's highly likely that eventually vaccines could work for the Zika. However, the Zika virus, uh, 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 we don't know anything about the mutation aspect of Zika virus. And uh, uh, anytime we talk about vaccines and its efficacy in, 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 in clinical trial, the mutation in, uh, aspect and the level of mutation determines the success or failure of vaccine-based clinical trial. And the, the virus is uh, spreading so fast, it's rapid, and hence it's not uh, we don't yet have the data. It's going to take some time before we can understand the mutational consequence. However, the serious, serious side effects that are the uh, disorders associated with Zika, i.e. microencephaly and the Guillain-Barre syndrome means we don't have the luxury to wait for the vaccine to work. And vaccine trials takes time to develop approval process is long, even if we try to go through an accelerated approval process. So I think in, uh, instead of relying on vaccine as a sole approach, it's going to be important to approach uh, Zika therapeutics from many different perspectives, repurposing of existing drug and development of backup drug-like compounds, as well as following the vaccine. So one or the other would end up uh, uh, benefiting the much uh, very badly needed people who need that treatment today and not 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. So where would you see the field of chemoinformatics evolving in the next five to 10 years? Yeah, chemoinformatics is a very, very exciting field and it has a very bright future. And uh, uh, one, one area where I think that five or 10 years from now, chemoinformatics is going to evolve is in the context of uh, uh, gene network-based interaction. That means if we are, a, right now, we are, for example, able to create synthetic life of bacteria, synthetic uh, uh, life of what we call as electronic cell or virtual cell. These are called E-cell, and E-cell can be created which incorporates all the proteins which are in, uh, encompassed by that particular cell. And one can ask a question, any perturbation to that cell, how does it respond? What are the physiological responses? So right now we have E cells available for bacteria, for liver cell, for, uh, for kidney, for neuron, uh, for cardiac cells. So I can see that five years from now, it would be possible to do a lot of lead identification and lead optimization using this type of virtual cell model, whereby we ask a question, if we take a defined chemical structure, a small molecular weight compound, introduce it into the simulation model, what type of gene network and pathways and uh, are affected and could we predict some of the side effects, unnecessary consequences that affect some pathway which would be deleterious. So that means we can be begin to think of removing the randomness from in drug discovery process, but go more and more towards modeling based approaches to do a lot of experiments in silico. And I can even stretch out my thinking to next level that now it takes less than $1,000 to completely sequence the human genome. So that means it's possible to look at this type of E-cell in the context of chemoinformatics-based uh, uh, approaches to ask a question, can it be uh, 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 fitted in the context of personalized medicine? 
and would a drug even before it is be going to be introduced into clinical trial would it fit in certain type of genetic profile so knowing the individual variations at the nucleotide level determine patient's response to therapy so it should be possible so i'm thinking out loud i'm talking about 10 years from now that i strongly believe that it should be possible that means our ability to come up with smarter leads is going to be much more uh, uh, accurate and much more advanced with the blending chemistry with biology with simulation type of model. So that's where I see chemoinformatics would evolve. That's great. It's a really exciting perspective. Um, that's my final question. So I'd just like to remind the viewers that MedChemNet is on Twitter, at MedChemNet, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on today's interview. Thank you once again, Professor, for participating. Thank you. It's a pleasure. You Have much. a nice day. You too.